share uh, share my my very best friend uh, with you. And I'm so so grateful to Women's Council for this opportunity. Um, I've had many opportunities to to go across the country and share my sweet mom. And um, I truly mean this, but I am, I always walk away from the Women's Council events um, inspired and refreshed and just the spirit of uh, camaraderie and uplifting uh, from those meetings um, really fuel um, why, why I do what I do to, to help um, the industry. So without further ado, I would love to tell you um, my mom's story. And I tell my mom's story, um, it, is, it is painful to relive it and it's a hard story to hear, but I, I think that it's an important story. I tell it because I think that it is a, a very teachable story. I think that there's a lot that we can learn from my mom. Um, I continue to learn from my mom's story. And, you know, as we all know, it's, it's so easy to get complacent, especially since we're, the, we're good, hardworking people. And uh, we can lose sight of the fact that there are some that walk among us that, that aren't. Uh, if you are not familiar with my mom and her story, uh, my mom was a real estate agent. Um, here in the Little Rock, Arkansas area, and uh, which you might be able to tell from my accent, <laughs> um, but we um, are a family of real estate agents now, but at the time, my mom was the only one in real estate, and uh, my mom was tricked by two very bad people. She was tricked by a husband and wife who kidnapped her and ultimately ended her life, and uh, for the next little bit of time, I want to tell you her story because I want to tell you how she was deceived because it um, the it's somewhat complex in how they did it. And so I think that um, just with a few things that you can implement, you can keep this from ever happening to you. To tell you a little bit about my sweet mom uh, as we begin today. Not only was she a realtor here in Arkansas, but she was, uh, she had been married to my dad for almost 34 years. She was uh, 50 years old. And so if you do that math, um, you know that, that my parents were high school sweethearts and um, spent, uh, spent a lifetime together. And uh, I tell you, I would ask that if you're a person of faith to, to continue to remember my dad in your prayers. So uh, my dad is still having a very hard time moving on from, from losing, losing my mom. Uh, my mom was a uh, mom to three boys. She had me when she was 16 years old. So um, in a lot of ways, my mom and I grew up together because <laughs> we went to college together. We ran five Ks and 10 Ks together. And, uh, and of course, among, you know, all of her roles and everything that she did, um, if there are any grandparents on today, you can attest that I'm sure you're just as, your grandkids are just as rotten as, as my mom's were. Um, so to start with, um, you know, the safety classes are tough in a number of ways, right? But um, to start with an uncomfortable truth of why my mom, why was she selected? Why, um, you know, when, when these bad people, it was a husband and wife, when they were asked repeatedly, why Beverly? How did you choose her? Why did you choose her? It always came back to two things. One, they perceived her to be rich, so they called her a rich broker, and they knew because that she, of course, worked in an industry that they could get her a loan. And so I'd like to, to peel this back a little bit because um, really what made my mom a target actually applies to all of us. So um, I don't know about your, your career path in real estate, but mine has not yet been as successful as my mom's was. <laughs> um, she was quite successful at times in real estate. And um, I think I did a whopping three transactions last year. So, <laughs> so, you know, there might be, you know, I have friends and you, you all have probably experienced this, that they kind of poke fun and say how nice it must be to be a rich realtor and be able to just set your own hours and do what you want to all day. And, um, you know, it's kind of tongue in cheek as, as I say that, um, it also can 
can set us up to be targets because, you know, we have our beautiful marketing and, you know, we're taught by every real estate coach to make it till we make it. And um, that can give an impression to bad people seeking to take from us that we have um, more than maybe even perhaps we do. Um, to tell you a little bit about how they built this perception of my mom. Uh, when the investigators, the detectives got a search warrant and they got into the house of these bad people, they got their laptop. And so they went through the search history of their laptop and found that this couple had done a number of internet searches on my mom. They had Googled my mom. And, you know, you probably have heard people say, you know, the importance of Googling your new clients, finding out whatever you can, you know, about them online prior to meeting with them. But it's eerie to know that people could do just the same thing to us. They had also gone to Facebook and poked around in my mom's Facebook profile. And like so many of us, self-included on this, uh, on this session today, my mom's profile was 100% public. And we do that because we want to be accessible to the communities that we serve and we're a part of. But it's eerie to know that people could be digging through your photos to try to validate that you are a person of wealth. And then lastly, and I think, honestly, I think it's the most like eerie thing for me and my mom's, like in this, this research bit that they did, is that they took my mom's name online to county property records and they searched her out to, to determine where my mom lived and the property value of the home that my mom lived in. And based solely on these internet searches for publicly available information, they built this, um, well, I, or I should say, you know, they built this mindset that my mom was so rich, and this is their word, so rich that they would never have to work again just based on those, those three things that they did online. And so then that really, you know, not to, you know, I, and I, I say this disclaimer, this isn't about me putting my parents' personal financial information out there on the street for everyone to know, but to make the point even more, that, that they based, that they perceived my mom to be so rich and my mom wasn't. My mom was in a bit of a lull. She had taken some time off and, you know, she was very much looking forward to the next commission check like so many of us are. And so, you know, I, I know I've kind of gone over this point a million times, but before we leave this slide, just the point is that their perception of my mom's wealth drove them to the conclusion that she had so much money that they could kidnap her, never have to work again. And unfortunately, the things that they used to make that uh, decision were actually apply to all of us in this industry. This particular slide, I, I designed it this way somewhat intentionally because, you know, I wanted it to make the point that if you didn't know the context of this story and what happened, my mom. You know, this, this particular slide could be in the middle of any real estate presentation. You've got an external, you know, a decent external shot of this house. You've got a street address. You've got, you know, a poorly written <laughs> property description and the um, and an appointment time. And the reason why I made that just kind of look like just another day in real estate is because the the situation, the day that this happened to my mom, it was just like another day in real estate. After being in the business for about a dozen years and, you know, she got her broker license and she was even uh, a real estate educator. She taught at a, a pre-licensure classes at a local school. She, um, she loved the business. She took it seriously. She, um, you know, over that entire career, undoubtedly, my sweet mom had helped hundreds of clients get into um, get in or, or or sell properties, and throughout that tenure, I know my mom must have toured thousands of homes. Yet all it took was one, 
It took one appointment with these, this husband and wife, these very bad people, and I lost my sweet mom. And so if I may, I'd like to, to talk to you about what the introduction to these people was like for my mom and the events that led up to this appointment. And if you would, just for the purpose of kind of putting yourself in it and visualizing and then thinking, would you have made the same decisions my mom did? And if you would have, then how can you change your business processes or your behaviors in the future to keep this from, to safeguard you from this? So first thing, imagine with me that today you begin getting phone calls, texts, and emails from um, a new buyer lead. You begin conversing, you know, all three methods, phone calls, texts, and emails with husband and wife. Their story is that they've relocated due, uh, to your area due to work. They're already in the area. They're living in a temporary um, you know, a rental situation and they want, they're miserable there. They want to get into their permanent residence as soon as possible. And thankfully, to help expedite that process, they're cash buyers. So everything sounds good there, right? You're talking about husband and wife, and now we begin the, the journey of finding them their home. So my mom, you know, did like we all do. She you know, went straight to the MLS and she put in everything that she had learned, of, you know, about what they were looking for in a property. She used that email address that they had given her to, you know, give them alerts to the types of properties they were interested in. Inventory, you know, it's laughable to say this now because when my mom was taken, it was 2014 and inventory now is way lower than, than it was then. But mom was having a hard time finding a home that, that really kind of was a, enough interest to this couple for them to want to see it. And so she began doing like, like we all do. Uh, she began talking to other agents and saying, hey, I'm working with this couple. Here's their story. Here's what they're looking for. If you know of something that's going to hit the market, please let me know. And you know, imagine them when the detectives, when we're trying, my mom's missing and they're trying to find my mom, that, you know, there are so many agents that knew of this couple that my mom had been working with. And really, I, I think that it even adds to really the tragedy of the whole thing, even more so, because my mom touched so many people just trying to do her job, just trying to serve these people. But to peel, you know, this back a little bit, um, my mom had no idea that every bit of that foundation was a lie. And so, you know, as she was interacting with them on phone calls and texts, the phone number that she was interacting with, the area code of that number matched that of this state that they said they, they were moving in from. My mom had no idea, though, that that number was a spoof number. These people had downloaded an app on their cell phone that gave them a spoof number that actually gave them, not only protected their anonymity, but it gave the impression that they were truly out-of-state buyers when all the time they had just been right across town. And then, of course, you know, we can be reminded, and it's because it's not every day that we're creating email accounts, but any of us with about a minute of time on our hands can go to any free email subscription service, you know, the Yahoo's and Gmail's of the world and create an email account with any name we want. And that's just what these people had done. They had taken their fictitious names and created an email account with those names in it, which who knows, you know, we can only speculate what of these components may have added to this seeming like a safe, normal situation or that their story was in some way true. You know, my poor dad and, and I always joke that, you know, it's like, you know, God bless the people that are married to realtors because um, whether they want to or not, they get to hear the ins and outs of every transaction that we work on, the, the, the good and the bad. And, and um, my, my dad was no exception. 
just like my mom had talked to other agents in her office about this couple, my mom had talked to my dad about him. So he, about them, and he knew all the details that you know right now. But again, not knowing that the only thing that was true about what I've told you is it truly was a husband and wife. Everything else was a lie. They had no intentions of purchasing a property. The names that they had given were wrong. And my mom had no idea. Every time she interacted with that husband, she was interacting with a seven-time felon that intended to kidnap her. To give you a little bit of context about this house, because I think it's important, you know, you hear safety instructors talk about the importance of situational awareness and the, you know, I think that sometimes our guards can come down because when we are in familiar territory, right? And to give you some, some context about this, this property, um, it's located in within the community that my parents lived in. It's kind of hard to see, but if you look at this house you know, to the left, you can tell that it sits right on the lake. My parents' house was also on the same lake. You know, Evie, I kind of, while my parents lived here, like, you know, kind of, we knew of this house from the vantage point of the lake. You know, any given weekend, we would get on my parents' boat and we'd see this house. And so while it was commonplace and familiar and comfortable, and I, I kind of cringe to, to even say this, but a place that you would think was really safe, just a few doors down is where the pastor of my mom's church lives. And, um, but we also knew that this house, and my mom knew better than, than any of us, that this house also um, had a bit of a sad story. Uh, this house had been foreclosed upon years and years ago and had just really sat and um, fallen into disrepair. And so um, there have been issues through the years of squatters. There have been issues uh, with people that got in there and just vandalized it, stolen everything of value from light fixtures to faucets to copper wiring. I mean, just, just a real mess, real mess. And so to make things even a little bit more complicated, and this makes the point for accurate uh, real estate photography that properly represents the condition of the property. At the time that, of my mom's kidnapping, this property, how it was represented online was the picture that you see up the top left. That was followed by a couple of very, very dark photos that were taken with an old model camera phone. I mean, just awful, awful photos. And so then imagine, like, put yourself in, like, kind of knowing all those things. There's this house, you know, within your community, has a lot of potential, but certainly, you know, it's a real shame because it's going to take somebody a lot of time and money to come in here and get this house, uh, you know, a renovation. And um, so then imagine, you know, my mom's surprised when the husband calls my mom and says, we want to see this house. And so my mom then, and, you know, we can only speculate what was going through my mom's mind. And we only know about this phone call through the vantage point of the husband. So he later told the interrogators how this conversation went. He said when he called my mom to ask to see this house, that my mom uh, told him that she would be unable to show him this property because her brokerage had a rule that prevented her from showing property alone in a rural area. And so to peel that back a little bit, there was no such rule at my mom's brokerage. So then we have to begin to wonder, was my mom beginning to feel something in her gut that something was not quite right with this guy? And or, you know, again, it's a speculation, but could could we also think that perhaps she said that she knew this she, touring this home will be a big old waste of time? And she certainly couldn't point them to photos online because it was so poorly represented. 
But this, this is the tough part. So we can learn from mom and we can say whenever we find ourselves in a confrontation and at a loss for words, we can say things like, oh, so sorry, but com my company won't let me. But then what do you do when that husband hands the phone to his wife and the wife says, hey, I'm going to be coming straight from work. I'll meet you. But, you know, we'll all three come from our you know, respective places. We'll meet here at the same time. Will your company be OK with that? And, you know, this is this part of the story is truly a moment that I think that my mom's story in person um, is most impactful because it's at this point in the story where you begin to see agents kind of looking around with that that wide eyed glare of, you know what? And I, in, I'm not speaking on behalf of all agents. I'm just speaking on behalf of what I've seen as, as I've told this in the past. But many agents say or react to when there was a wife involved, I would have been all in. And whether that's right, wrong, whatever, right? But so many of us, and I'll just tell them myself, this, we, let's exclude everybody else. But prior to this happening to my mom, if I were in you know a new a new um you know buyer seller situation and there was a female involved i would have deemed it safe because personally based on my biases i'm bringing to the table you know that that's not an unsafe situation however the wife plays a very critical role in keeping my mom engaged in this story keeping my mom um from walking away potentially. She was a very big part of the deception and the planning. And so my mom told that wife that that would be fine. And mom said that she would need to set the, the appointment no later than 6 p.m. because this was late September and the days were getting shorter. And you know, she wanted, because there were no utilities at this house, wanted to make sure that they could tour the house in the daylight. Just great safety. So the day comes that that they're to, to meet at this house. It's Thursday, September 25th. And, you know, I, I say that my mom had just such a regular real estate day, if there is such a thing, but uh, certainly a regular real estate day uh, pre-COVID. And uh, in that she spent most of the day working out of her office and she went to an affiliate luncheon. And don't you guys miss those? Um, we should all be much skinnier now, but it doesn't seem to be working out. for me. <laughs> we don't have affiliates keeping us fed. Um, but um, my mom went to an affiliate luncheon and she won 50 bucks at that luncheon. And so after the luncheon, she went back to her office and again began to talk about this couple with other agents in her office. And then she called my dad to let my dad know what her itinerary looked like for the rest of the day. Good tip from mama. And, you know, as I share these things about, about that, I think we can learn from the good things that mom did, but it makes the point of how diligent we have to be with safety, right? It's not just one single thing. It's like you have to be so prepared in so many different ways. Um, but my mom told my dad that she would um, be showing this house, and he's very familiar with this house, um, at 6 o'clock. And that she was excited because she had won 50 bucks. And they out by their house was this, this little dive Mexican restaurant. And so she that they love. And so she said, after I show the property, I will pick up dinner and I'll see you at home. And um, I mean, a Thursday, like a hundred before it. I mean, just so unremarkable. Um, my mom got to this property early. My mom made a number of uh, real estate related phone calls from the driveway of this, this property while she awaited the clients. Um, 
you know, I think there's a safety message too in arriving early. Um, gives us certainly an opportunity to, to check things out. But there's a point I want to make before I tell you about these bad people. As my mom sat there that day in, in that driveway, there had been no exchange of ID. There had been no pre-buyer consultation in a public place. There had been no exchange of proof of funds. It was just a lot of communication via three methods that really perpetuated, was able to, to fuel these people's lives, but in no way exposed their true identity. And so um, at six o'clock, my mom, we don't know which happened, but around six o'clock, two things happened. One is that the wife began to text my mom and she was apologizing because she had gotten caught up at work and was unable to make it to the train. And she had a request of my mom though. She, she asked my mom to proceed with the showing and if my mom would be so kind as to take photos with her phone and text them to the wife so that she could get a better idea of what the interior of this home looked like and be available uh, via text as she went through this property to answer questions related to the property. And so it would be though as though this wife was on this showing, at least digitally. And at around that same time, a black car pulls in by my mom in the driveway of this house. And a young Caucasian male with short, dark hair got out and approached my mom. He had the same story as the wife. Um, he was apologizing that the wife had gotten caught up and asked my mom to proceed with the showing. And, uh, you know, again, we can only speculate how my mom must have felt in that moment. Um, but I tell you, every time I tell this story, um, it is at this point of the story that my stomach is on fire for her. This is the last moment. This is the last opportunity to make a decision that would make a drastic out um, difference in the outcome. Per se. Sorry. Uh, she was so sweet y'all I mean she just was so sweet and so southern and so bubbly uh, and so my sweet mom she she agreed to uh show this house and to take the photos and to answer the questions and um goodness um at the conclusion of the trial, we got my mom's cell phone back. It had been found in, in the home of these bad people. And then, of course, was evidence during, during the trial. And, uh, you know, it was awful for me to open my mom's camera roll and discover, you know, that the last 10 photos on my mom's camera were of the interior of this house where she was helping and doing her best to, to serve these people. Um, that picture that you see on the bottom right of your screen was taken um, by my mom. That photo was the, uh, represents the very last moment of my mom's freedom. It was as my mom was taking that photo that she was caught off guard. Um, the bad guy had a taser and he put it in her side. And uh, he's been very proud to admit that the, the last words that my mom heard of her freedom was that she was about to have a very bad day. And he tased my mom and uh, he bound her with duct tape. Her ankles and her hands behind her back 
her eyes all around her head and her mouth all around her head. He then came outside and got into his car and turned it around and backed it up to this house and opened the trunk. And uh, there's a safety message in that. Everything that I told you about when he arrived at six o'clock and he was in a black car, Caucasian male with short, dark hair. He goes into this home with my mom. Moments later, comes out in his car, turns it around. All of those things were not pieced together by investigators or speculated. Those things were known to be true because they were witnessed firsthand. The neighbor that lived right across the street saw every bit of that happen. And so if there's something that I can impart to you is to to please be more diligent about reporting suspicious behavior to uh, law enforcement in the moment. That neighbor didn't tell anyone until much later that night, whenever detectives were door knocking and asking if anyone had seen anything because a realtor had gone missing. And that's when it came to light. That man put my mom in the trunk of that car. And, uh, you know, it as if it wasn't bad enough that he was doing that to her. Um, before he closed the lid of the trunk of that car, he took out his cell phone and he took a picture of my mom in the trunk of that car and he texted it to his wife. And we can only assume that he did that. Uh, to show his wife that their master plan was in play. And to tell you about that master plan, how they actually wanted to get all this money. Remember, so much money, they'd never be able to spend it all. They'd never have to work again. By the way, and I'm sure my mom is in heaven like, boy, don't tell my business. My mom had $167 in her checking account that day. Literally kidnapped her based on a perception that wasn't real. But the plan was to have my mom do a series of videos that would tell my dad to transfer all of this wealth into accounts that were accessible via cards in my mom's purse. But as many of you ladies can attest, and this is another one of those things that's kind of the beauty of being in person, because we can kind of, you know, talk about things that we do alike and learn from one another. But um, I find that so many ladies are like my mom and they have a, a uh, personal you know, business practice of leaving their purses locked in the car while they show property, whether if it's for safety, security, or you know, just general practicality. My mom didn't carry a firearm or anything or other personal protection device, so it just made sense for her to leave her purse locked in the car. However, in this bad guy's haste to take my mom and to tase her and put her in the trunk of that car and take a picture, he left behind the purse because it wasn't in his, it will be you no know, truly out of sight, out of mind. And so from the second he drove away from that house, he had no idea at the time that he was actually, his plan was already ruined. He then, still not knowing that the plan was off the rails, he took my mom and he made her do a video. The video was never delivered to my dad, but it was essentially, it was a, it was a video from my mom telling my dad not to call the cops. They then took my mom and uh, locked my mom up in their master bathroom. Um, this is the, the bathroom of the, the bad people. And, uh, you know, kind of in parallel then, you know, at about 8.30 that night, I began to hear from my dad asking if I had heard from my mom because she wasn't being responsive to his text or his phone call. 
And like any one of your kids, I'm sure would do. I was like, welcome to real estate. You know, she's probably like, you know, they brought in family or they, she's writing a contract or, you know, dad, this is fine. No news and real estate is probably a good thing. But he was insistent and he mentioned that house. And so I encouraged him to go over and, and just see if anything. And of course, my dad arrived on the scene to that house, which was not nearly as nice in person as that photo with a yard with overgrown, you know, grass, no utilities, pitch black. But there in the driveway was my mom's car. The front door of that property was left open. And it was literally, I mean, it was like my mom had just vanished, just vanished. Dad got mom's car keys, second set of car keys. He went back home and got the second set of car keys and opened my mom's car to find that in her passenger seat of her car was the her client file that she'd created for this couple where she had actually documented every lie they had told her. And then, of course, locked inside her car was her purse. And so, of course, we we end up out on the scene that night and we are brainstorming real estate scenarios that make her okay and explain, you know, why she's not there and what has happened. Really hard to reconcile an agent disappearing without their car or their purse and not being responsive to phone interaction. This entire timeline that you see here on the screen is the time that this is the entire time my mom was missing. That appointment was at 6 p.m. on September 25th. My mom's body was found in the early morning hours of September 30th. And I tell you, I could I could spend some time here telling you, you know, about how horrible this time was for our family. Um, as you can imagine. But instead, I would just like to quickly say this time will always represent um, a time that the real estate industry showed my family what it's capable of. It was real estate agents that filled these soybean fields trying to find my mom. It was real estate agents that, I mean, they, it was real estate agents that rented ATVs and got horses. And I mean, it was like every way you can travel, real estate agents were doing it. There were real estate agents in helicopters. I mean, I'm not even kidding. It was just, it was nuts. And yet incredible. Um, our industry rallied in such um, an amazing way around my family to try to find my mom. It will probably come as no surprise to you, but. When my mom's body was found, the media had caught wind that where, you know, kind of a hot spot where they were looking for my mom. And um, so it was instantly leaked online and Facebook when my mom's body was found. And so agents that were awake at 3 a.m. in the morning saw that and instantly came to my house to tell me so that I didn't wake up to find out on social media that my mom's body had been found. So that all that to say that it is, uh, you know, I know we work in a tough industry and we sometimes get cross with one another, but goodness, when we need to come together, we come together in a mighty way, whether it's for missing persons or wildfires or hurricanes, uh, such, such a great group. Realtors Relief Fund, um, which speaking of, I ran the 5K. I don't know if any of you all participated in the 5K, but uh, I ran that. I was in the top 10, but I think I'm falling, I'm falling off. Um, but certainly, you know, everything that, that this industry has done for my family fuels our gratitude and uh, the work that we do with this. Um, I told you that yeah, uh, mom was 50 when she was taken from us. And uh, this was her 50th birthday party. That um, it's my dad on the left and my brother on the right. Um, if I may just tell you, you know, we 
so much of my mom's experience, we we can only speculate, right? How awful um, those circumstances were. But we know of three things that my mom, we know that she did in response to this horrible thing that happened to her. And one is that in that video that she was made to, to tape um, or record, Lord, um, she, you know, she was telling my dad not to call the cops, but the last words that she spoke. And this was just after being pulled out of the trunk of a car and made to do this ransom recording. Uh, she closed that video by saying, telling my dad that I just want you to know I love you very much. Evidence was found by, from the detectives that while my mom was in the trunk of that car, that she got her hands free and she was fighting for her freedom. And then lastly, we know through the testimony of the wife that while my mom was locked in their bathroom, that although the wife never interacted with her, she said that she remained haunted by because she had to sit there the, that entire time and uh, listen to the sounds of my sweet mom's prayers. And so uh, I am so sorry this happened to my mom, but uh, I cannot be more inspired by her response to, to it through loving and fighting and uh, maybe most importantly, just clinging to her faith even to the very end. To tell you a little bit more about how this plan went south so fast is that that bad guy, once he got home and got my mom locked up in his bathroom, they then it was the, the light bulb went off that they didn't have the purse. They needed the purse to carry this plan out to be able to get the money. And so that bad guy left his wife with a firearm to guard that bathroom door to keep my mom from escaping while he came back to get and upon arriving at the scene that night, he arrived, uh, you know, just to the site of probably 10 cop cars, with blue lights everywhere. Um, of course, all of our family vehicles were out there. So he comes back and he happens upon this scene and he's actually stopped and questioned by a detective about his knowledge of the disappearance of a local real estate agent. He denied knowing anything. And it was like, with so many of these, these criminals, it's just that they think that they have the best and the brightest plan. It'll work. They won't get caught. And then they see blue lights. And it's like a moment of clarity that this, this plan was really dumb and it won't work. And so he went back to his home and he and his wife were in a panic that they were going to get caught. They were so confused because how could people have known where my mom was showing property to? How could this be closing in so fast? And so they made the decision to change their plan from kidnapping and ransom to kidnapping and, and murder. This spot that you see here is where my mom was found, where my mom took her last breath. Um, after days, all those days that I showed you on that timeline of real truth searching, and of course, it, this incredible team of 26 investigators that, that worked on my mom's case around the clock, uh, they found her here. And... Uh, I'm thankful that there was at least justice in some sense of the word. I'm thankful my mom was found. These bad people are in prison now. Um, the wife took a plea deal. So in exchange for her testimony against her husband, she got 30 years. Uh, she'll be eligible for parole after she served 21 years. Her husband um, got two life sentences without the possibility of parole for both capital murder and for kidnapping. Um, so I'm thankful that um, at least they, they can do, um, you know, no physical harm to anyone where they are.
I know my mom's story is hard to hear. It's certainly hard for me to tell it. But if, if you don't mind, I just want to quickly hit on some of these bullets because this is these are the things that we've hit on as we went through my mom's story together. One is that bad guys fit no definable profile. Make things so much easier if it did. But um, in my mom's case, it was a young, attractive couple. And uh, I, so I hope that, you know, we, we put so much focus on our ethics and our fair housing that I hope that you will take those same principles and apply them consistently to your screening of new clients. What's good for one is good for all. I hope that you will insist upon in-person buyer consultations, even if it's not in person and you have to put get them on Zoom, uh, do something, see their face prior to seeing it at a banking property. I hope that you will have a system where you can obtain identification. Um, if you use a CRM, you know, enable the fe uh, features to uh, store that image of, of their ID on your CRM, and give access to a trusted colleague. Hope you'll use the internet like those bad people used it against my mom. I hope that you have people in your lives that you can turn, um, you know, I, I don't just say just share your itinerary and your location, but also enable your technology to where it's always on for your, you know, your people, your tribe, um, because sometimes it's just tough to remember to, to share these things. Um, I know for my circle, I our, our location's always on. Um, if you guys have ever heard of the app, Life360, I know so many families use it. And uh, I've got teenagers, and let me tell you, they're not doing anything without me knowing exactly what they're doing and how fast they were driving. Um, the best app ever. <laughs> um, um, I I hope you'll trust your instincts. It's so easy to be dismissive of that one, but I just, I can't help but just know that my mom had to have felt some of that, that burning in her tongue. You know, I think my mom, my mom's story illustrates the importance of keeping clients in front of us as, you know, we know what happened to her with that, that taser. And then as we learn from the neighbor, I hope that you will feel empowered to report suspicious activity and uh, let someone else investigate, you know, just check it out. In the aftermath of losing my mom, um, I um, began to tell her story. And really, for the longest, it was a story that was just to, to brag on my mama because I didn't know what to do with such an immense loss that happened in such a public way. And along the way, I realized how much we can learn from my mom. And in sharing her story, agents have told me ways that they've been victimized. And it just, one story led to another story, led to another story. And I've met literally hundreds of agents that have been victimized in different ways, from stalking to harassment to assault. I mean, it's just, it's gut-wrenching. And so I... Um, started this nonprofit in January of 2017. We have uh, an incredible, incredible group of volunteers. It's just a, a total labor of love. So all that being said, I hope that you will um, interact with us. Um, if you have safety tips, send them our way. We'll share them out. Um, but it's it's been it's been a good way for me to uh, to kind of find purpose through the pain that I've experienced of losing my best friend. Um, in addition to what we do at the, the Beverly Carter Foundation to raise safety awareness, um, I've been super impressed with uh, the CE shop. They have some free resources. And then I don't know if you guys have been to, it's like um, the timing is perfect with it being um, national conference right now, but NAR safety section is just got a complete overhaul. And um, I'm not just saying this because it's safety. It's, it is good. It used to be a little hard to navigate, um, but it is so good. Um, so if you feel kind of a fire in your belly, I hope you do to make a difference at your local brokerage, um, then I, I hope that you can just go pull one, one or two things down and share it and um, it could make all the difference in someone's life. Um, the last slide that I will leave you with um, photo of my kids with a for sale sign of my mom's. And um, 
this photo was taken one week prior to my mom being taken from us. Uh, we, of course, had no idea how much our lives would change just, change just a week later. Um, I'm a distance runner, and so my kids, back when they were young and sweet in this photo, they are no longer like this. Um, they would uh, run with their dad. They wanted to be cool, like dad. And um, so anyway, we we ran the neighborhood, and mom was a big listing agent in my neighborhood. And, and so we stopped, and we took this photo, and we posted it on our Facebook wall, and so she loved it. But um, very sweet, sweet memory. But if you guys don't mind, I, I'd like to just leave you with a final thought and uh, related to this photo, if you don't mind me making a little cheesy and symbolic. Um, and that is that, you know, if that for sale sign can be, you know, representative of you, of your commitment to your career in real estate, your excellence in this industry, um, I just hope that my mom's story um, in some small way um, has has helped you to to be more mindful of the people on the periphery of your career, the people that so desperately need you to come home safely and whose lives to be uh, forever traumatized. They were to lose you. Um, cannot thank you all for this immense opportunity. Um, wishing you all safety and health and wealth, um, all the things. Um, thanks again for for being with us. And stay safe, everyone.